Hey, thanks for continuing with me today for episode four of Business in the Bedroom, a bootstrapper's guide to doing it. I'm your host, Jemmy Lagagna, and today I'm going to talk to you about being professional while wearing pajamas. (laughs) This episode is brought to you by Flintstone Media. Listen in and let's do this. Well, if you're coming to episode four straight off of episode three, you just heard me talk all about how to collect and maintain an online portfolio, but most importantly, how that portfolio will be influential on your reputation as a professional and have people willing or not willing (laughs) to turn their hard earned money over to you for goods and services. Well, the other half of that is how you represent yourself aside from samples of your work. Even if you are building a business outside of your bedroom, even if you're wearing pajamas at every turn, you still need to be professional in every way. So says the girl with the show titled Business in the Bedroom. (laughs) Whatever. Let's chat about what that means. Not business in the bedroom, about being professional in every way. Some of this is going to sound so obvious, but humans are really funny animals. Sometimes you just need to hear it. And you truly do only have one chance to make a first impression. So keep that in mind as you're listening to all of this. Let's start off talking first about emails. So it's super simple with emails. Be prompt be responsive. This was very difficult for me in the early days of Flintstone Media for two reasons. One, because I was just so busy, (laughs) so slumped and busy that sometimes I just physically couldn't get to emails. So I understand that. So there's a little bit of an asterisk with this, but be prompt and be responsive. Once I was able to get a handle on being more prompt and being more responsive, that's when my business really started to take off even more. So if you can adapt that earlier than I did, be prompt and be responsive. And the other reason that it took me sometimes a long time to do that is something I spoke about on an earlier episode, that whole imposter syndrome thing. You know, I would talk myself out of answering because I didn't think I had a good answer. Or I'd be too scared to even look at the email and say, okay, what is their problem? Because once I read it, their problem becomes my problem. I didn't have the confidence to handle it. It's that whole imposter syndrome. It's total crap. You have the skills, you have the talent, so have the confidence right along with it and be prompt and responsive to emails. And then when you do respond, make sure that you use good grammar. Guys, Please, please, please proofread before you hit send. This can be because of grammar, okay, issues. It could also be because of spelling. It could be because you need to make sure that you are actually sending it to the correct person. If you are lucky enough to have multiple clients with the same name, you want to make sure that you're sending the right people the right stuff. I just closed on my third client named Joy. (laughs) I know I'm working with three different hosts named Joy, one on HRN, one on the Wedding Biz Network, and one who's an independent client. So I need to make sure that I always send the proper emails to the right person. So proofreading involves grammar. It involves making sure you're sending it to the right person. And then also make sure you have a really strong signature block. So in your signature block, in your email service, there should be an opportunity for you to craft and specify your signature block. So not only should it have your name, but it should also have the contact information, right? You should have your phone number in there, your website should be linked in there, put your logo all nice in your signature block. If you have a closing line that you're kind of famous for, that you say a lot, or, you know, something catchy, maybe put that in there. Like I know one of my clients, the HRN crew, they tend to close their emails on their signature block. One of them has a line that says, now go ride your horse, okay? So but it's fun and it's cute and it's memorable. So make sure you put together a good, strong signature block. And that's just the thing that closes out your email. <laughs> if you're not sure what I'm talking about, okay? Make sure you, you put that together and you standardize it. And then the last thing I'll say about emails, use reply all with care, okay? Reply all can be a super dangerous button. So make sure you use it with care. Don't bombard your clients or your team with emails and a string that they don't need to see every single one of. That can really bog down people's inboxes. So you want to be courteous and mindful of that. And you also want to make sure that you don't accidentally reply to someone or include someone in a reply that you don't want them to see what you're writing. Guys, you should reply all with care. 
All right, moving on from emails into documentation. What do I mean by that? Documentation is anything really that visually represents you, okay? So that can be, first and foremost, your logo. You want it to be nice and professional looking. That could be something that you learn to design yourself, which we'll talk about in another episode called Jacking and Jilling. (laughs) We're gonna talk all about that in our launch, guys. Um, This is one of the things you need to learn or you can learn possibly is some graphic design, but you need to make sure that your logo looks really good and professional. So whether you do it yourself or you hire someone to do it, which are great ways to hire people for that kind of stuff, you need to make sure you have a good professional looking logo. It's the first thing a lot of people see. And then you also want to make sure that your website looks really good. We're going to talk all about that, but make sure that your website looks really good. If you have a website that still looks like it was built in 1995, you need to refresh your website. It is time to update it, okay? If you have a website that still has a visitor counter at the bottom of it, I see you. It's time to update your website. Nobody does that anymore, okay? And you want to make sure that you are seen as current and with it and with the time. So make sure you have a nice professional looking website. Also, your promotional materials are included in this. Okay, so your business cards, not only should they have your logo nicely on them, but they themselves need to be designed with care. They shouldn't be super flimsy paper. Like it might cost you an extra couple bucks when you order 200 of them to make nice card stock, but it's worth it. Okay, good, nice business cards. When we are in the business of talking to people face to face again and passing something hand to hand again, you want a nice business card that represents yourself. Also, depending on what you do, you may need to put either a media kit together or some sort of professional one sheet. Okay, so a media kit, as an example, from what I do in my business is what shows off the shows and shows off who I am. But you can have a promotional one sheet for really anything you do. It can be used to promote yourself. Let's say you want to be a public speaker. It can be used to promote and picture yourself or your idea or your invention or whatever to investors. So it's this sheet that essentially breaks down who you are, what you're about, what your services are about, and anything that represents you and your services in that way, anything that you're sending off to people and putting together needs to look professional, okay? You really need to make sure you put that extra effort and make sure it looks nice and clean and well thought out because that is going to be how people understand you're going to treat the work you do for them. If you don't take care and proofread your emails. If you don't take care and make sure that your business card and product looks really good, they're going to know that you're not going to take that care for their end product as well. And that also applies when you're putting proposals together for clients. So your proposals need to look really, really professional too. So the language that's included in them, if there are graphics included in them, how they're laid out, make sure your proposals look really clean, polished, and include of all the essential information, price points, all the details that whatever line of business you're in, that it applies. So make sure your proposals for your clients are also very professional. So already all of this can start to sound like a lot of work, right? It takes effort just to look good. It's true. But one way to cut down on that effort is to use templates. Trust me, your future self Well, thank you. I use templates for everything, emails, proposals, pitch decks, like literally everything I have templates for. As an example, when I'm training new podcasters, they can basically either decide to record independently or record with us, where we have a recording producer actually link up with them as an extra service. But for those who do want to record independently, I send them a list of recording tips after we've done training that they can then keep in a convenient place, right? And they love receiving this. So it's just this extra above and beyond give that I offer them. But how silly would it be for me to rewrite that list every single time? It wouldn't make any sense for me to do that. No, absolutely not. I have a document in my Google Drive, which I have all of that laid out. So it's literally all in there ready for me to simply copy and paste it into an email. And so they get that within minutes after we've hung up the phone. It's super simple. So templates work. Also, as part of my sales process, I'll send a formal proposal to a potential client after our initial call. 
which has all the details and the price points that we covered. I don't create that formal proposal fresh and new every single time. Absolutely not. I have a template saved in Google Drive. And it basically, I just have to replace their name or their business logo or whatever on it. If there are any particular details that need to be adjusted a little bit here and there, but the essentials of what I do, the core of my proposal is the same. And so I have a template for it. So you should too. Whatever it is that you do, any corners that you can see that you can cut and make things easier for your future self by using templates, trust me, it's worth it. And they need to look really, really good. So you can create templates for pretty much anything in Word or in Google, it's what's called Docs or PowerPoint. In Google, it's called Slides. There's a program called Canva that can be really good for creating graphic stuff. So if you need to create flyers or anything whatever, Canva, PowerPoint, Word, Slides, all these things are really great programs or any other kind of program with good text and graphic functionality, you can use that. And so use and learn to use one of those kinds of programs to start making yourself some good solid templates. And use your branded colors on everything. So that means, first of all, that you have to decide on a color palette for your brand, okay? So as you're putting together a logo, as you're thinking about your website, as you're thinking about the templates and what you want to put together for your proposals and blah, 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 you should have a palette of colors that you pull from. And all of your materials that you send out to people need to have those essential branded colors that represent you. If you look at anything created internally for the FSM brand, for the Flintstone Media brand, there is a set color palette that I use of a few basic colors. Mine are a couple of specific hues in the teal range and a certain orange color and then a basic blue and then some highlight and background colors like certain neutrals and grays that I'll consistently use. And then I apply those colors to everything to serve up that consistency with my brand. So from the Flintstone Media logo, all the Florida Podcast Network assets, all the way through to the logo for this show. I use the same color palette and it just lends itself to cohesiveness and adds a sense that you understand your own image and branding. And that lends itself to a sense of a higher level of professionalism. It's true. (laughs) And what would the age of social distancing be without talking about Zoom calls. So many more of you out there now know the pain and indignity of a Zoom call fail. (laughs) Okay. If you haven't experienced it yet, watch out for the sound of springs when you're adjusting yourself on your bed because you're on a Zoom call or whatever. Like there's so many things that can go wrong, but here's how to keep some of those things from going wrong. Be on time. Okay, just like you would for any in person meeting, be on time. Have good lighting, dress well, and do your hair. You want to actually look good. You want to act like you're walking into a client's office. So, however that looks, that doesn't mean you need to be wearing a pantsuit. I'm not a pantsuit girl. I have nothing against pantsuit girls. I'm just not a pantsuit girl. All right, I'm a jeans and t shirt girl, but I still have like a nicer looking t shirt or a, you know, decent blouse and a nice looking pair of jeans, no phrase, whatever, just in case I stand up and you happen to see. I don't want you seeing my pajama pants, okay? There can be a time for pajamas. Soon calls is not one of them. (laughs) All right. And you want to do your hair. You want to make yourself presentable. Okay. And then also something that I think more people are becoming aware of as painful instances have occurred and become public fodder for the viral interwebs. Mind your backgrounds, guys. In fact, having a particular dedicated space can make a real difference in helping to maintain easy control over your environment, your background sound, your interruptions. And also, yes, anything that can be in the background that you don't necessarily think of that you really don't want other people to see or to be distracting, right? You don't you want people paying attention to you when you're on your Zoom call, not to whatever random piece of art that your aunt uh, Jilly sent you on her random trip to somewhere, okay? That's very distracting and inappropriate. You don't want that. So mind your backgrounds. And also on another note, related to kind of setting up these Zoom calls in the first place, one thing that I've done over the last year or so to increase my projected level of professionalism has been using an online automatic scheduler. Those are services that you can tie to your calendar and that manage your calls and meetings and other appointments super, super easily. Like 
in your sleep, okay? Essentially, you set up the parameters and rules of your availability, and then you send the link to that calendar to whomever you're trying to meet with. For the service that I use, which is called Schedule Once, I can actually set up several of these different links for different purposes. So I have one that I use for scheduling general Flintstone media meetings. Like if a client wants to have a chat about whatever, that's the link they get. My free consultations have a different link, different parameters. My recording sessions, different link, different parameters, different availability, all of that, right? So you can manage and set up all of that. And then you send those links, whichever link's appropriate to that person. And when they click into it, they can see your availability and they can automatically set up to meet with you. You do nothing. <laughs> These are so great. And I can't stress enough what a difference it has made for me in my business. Not only does it make it so much easier as there's no annoying back and forth trying to match schedules. Oh, when are you available on this day? No, that's not going to work. My schedule is this and this morning, blah, blah, blah. blah, 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 blah. No, none of that. <laughs> <laughs> but also above and beyond avoiding that annoyance, the potential client or customer or whoever, they get a real impression that you not only have your shit together, but that you're in demand enough that you need to manage your time and that you're respectful of your time. You're going to be respectful of their time as a client, that you're managing your time for them when they come on as a client, all of that. All of that are those subconscious impressions that you really, really want to make and you want to make well. So building a business from your bedroom is great. Okay. It was a goal of mine to get out of a cubicle and to get to work from my bed in my pajamas every day if I wanted to, damn it. And I'm there now. But trust me, I've made both really smart choices and really bad mistakes along the way. So absorb all of these tips and learn from my lessons, please, please, please. It is not only completely possible to still be a highly professional person when working from home, but it's really necessary. Again, you're asking people to part with their hard earned money and to give it to you. <laughs> so you have to give them the confidence that you're going to deliver professional services. Next Monday, I'll be dropping episodes five and six, and they will dive into the tough reality of the time commitment you are signing up for when you decided to build a business on your own. You may have to learn to do a whole bunch of stuff you never imagined you would ever learn to do, and you will definitely have to make tough choices on the use of your time. So be sure to join in next week for all of that fun. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm assuming you're listening to this because you're either running a business in your bedroom or you're thinking about it. Well, I want to hear from you. Email me about your business and send me your questions. I'm at jemmy at flintstonemedia.com. That's jemmy spelled J-A-I-M-E at flintstonemedia.com. Then join the conversation by looking up Dreamers Become Doers on Facebook. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter as Flintstone Media. So you can find me there and follow me and have fun with me on any of those platforms. And for show notes and details on today's episode specifically, head to bizinthebedroom.com. And remember to hit it hard, keep the lights on. Flintstone Media has been the digital messaging bedrock of several brands and businesses, serving as a highly resourceful podcast production house and consultancy firm for over six years. Work with a leader in the industry and add a new podcast to your brand's content offerings. From show development and setup through recording and distribution, Jemmy will lend her experience launching dozens of podcasts and producing over a thousand episodes, making creating your show a simple and easy turnkey process for you. Visit FlintstoneMedia.com for podcast samples. That's FlintstoneMedia.com. <laughs>